I'll continue to talk to you on the series that I started two Sundays ago as to how to be led of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Chapter 23, let's read verse 1. <clears throat> and Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, listen to this. I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. That verse is in line or in context to what I'm about to say to you this morning. Let me ask you a question. Is your spirit a safe guide? Let me repeat. Is your spirit a safe guide? Are you being guided safely by your spirit? And that's what I want to talk to you on this morning as to how we could be led of our spirit. And how does our spirit get information and pass on information to my conscience? Or can I say, the voice of my spirit is my conscience. Your spirit must be a safe guide. Some years ago, we were fellowshipping in my home. We started a church in my home. And we were growing. It grew. There was no more room left. My living room was, was occupied. My dining room was occupied. My bedroom was getting occupied. And we had no more room. We had no other option but to move from there. And by now, I'm in full-time ministry. And one of the reasons we had to move was because we were, we were packed to capacity. And we were being troubled by our neighbors. The neighbors said, there's noise, there's confusion. Vehicles are parked out. And this is a residential area. And you people have started a church here. So... We decided to move, and I tried and tried and tried. I could not get a suitable place. If I got a suitable place, the rent was too high, the deposit was too high, and, uh, or if I got a place, I didn't like the area. So this went on for about seven or eight months, until one day, Sandra had gone to work, because three years after I resigned, she resigned. I've already resigned, this is, I think, almost a year after I resigned. And um, I was seated, she had gone to work. I dropped her at her work spot, I came back, and I was asking the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to do for today? And I felt led. I, I'm not talking about an audible voice. I just felt led, I had a scooter. The Lord said, sit on the scooter and ride. Ride where? Just ride. So, like a crazy person, I sat on my bike, I left my house from Benson Town, and I'm just riding, came down Pottery Road, and no direction, just as I'm led to ride, I'm riding the bike, and then I came up right up Pottery Town, crossed the railway gate over here, and immediately after I crossed the railway gate, I felt led to turn right. And I turned right. And very few yards away after I've been turning right, the Lord said, stop. So I stopped. And he said, turn left. I turned left. I seen a big building with a board to let. So I parked my bike. I went in over there, met the landlady. To make a long story short, she refused to give it for the church. But then um, I said, okay, beautiful place. It was a nice place for worship. So I returned back home and I was kind of disappointed because uh, she refused. And I found that to be a good location, a good place, big hall, everything okay for the church. And, uh, but anyway, before leaving that place, I seen one gentleman laid up on the bed over there. The landlady stayed over there. So I seen this person laid up on the cot and I felt led to go and pray for him. So I went and I prayed for this man. He was totally bedridden. He couldn't speak. He was paralyzed. He had an accident. So I prayed for this man and I left. A week later, I thought, let me go and have a try again. Let me go meet the landlady. 
So I come back a week later, and the moment she's seen me, she said, where did you go to? You never gave me your telephone number. I asked her, why? She said, we decided to give you the place. So I was so happy. I said, well, can I ask you what made you change your mind? Because last time when I came, you said, no, not for a church. She said, I want you to look at my son. Look at him there. He's seated. He said, hello to me. He was healed. So she said, his wife, that's her daughter-in-law, decided to give it to you and to no one else. So we got it. Now the question is, no one told me. I never had a dream. I never had a vision. I just been led to take my bike and keep going where I was led to go. So what I'm telling you is my spirit was a safe guide. Amen? We are being guided, and we're going to learn today how are we going to be guided. So we were there for 10 years before we moved in here. And now, if you notice, and I'm sure that you would have made this study, in the Old Testament, you would find out that there are more dreams being given to prophets and patriarchs than the New Testament. More in the Old Testament. Many people had dreams. You look at Joseph, he had dreams. You look at Daniel, he had dreams. You look at so many other prophets in the Old Testament, all have dreams. Now, most often, you dream while you're sleeping. Now, when they have a dream, they will go and tell the dream to somebody if it concerns that person or if it's concerning a nation. They have this dream. Now, at the same time, they also have visions. Visions most often does not happen when you're sleeping. Visions will happen when you're normally doing something. You're doing something, you're awake, you're, you know, your, your eyes are wide open and you, you're doing something and suddenly the Lord can show you a vision, an open vision. Peter had a vision. And, but not many in the New Testament. Some do have, sometimes we also have, but it's very remote. Now, why in the Old Testament there are more dreams and visions than of the New Testament? Because in the Old Testament, the prophets never had, or the laity, you know, the people, they never had the Holy Spirit like how we have. Amen? So since they never had the Holy Spirit, they had to have people who the Lord will give dreams and visions that will come and tell them what the Lord showed them in a dream or a vision. But in the New Testament, we don't need dreams, we don't need visions. What we have on the inside of us, inside our spirit, is the spirit of the living God. So if he wants to communicate anything to us, it's not going to be through a dream or a vision, but through an inward witness. Are you with me? Amen? So therefore, we, the congregation of we are, are so privileged compared to the Old Testament. 24-7, the Lord talks to us. Amen? And so the Lord com communicates to us uh, most of the time. Now, Daniel chapter 5, and read verse 12. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts, were found in the same Daniel whom the king named Belshazzar, now Daniel, now let Daniel be called and let him show interpretation. But look at the first few lines of that verse. Daniel had an excellent spirit. What is the meaning of this word, excellent spirit? Now listen, my brother and sister, in the very same way Daniel had an excellent spirit, you also can have. Amen? But how did Daniel develop this excellent spirit? that, you know, he was used in uh, interpreting dreams and visions and so on. The reason being, oh, how did Daniel have an excellent spirit? Let me put one word to it. Daniel had a sensitive spirit. 
Our spirits have to be sensitive. Our spirits have to be fine-tuned to what the Spirit of God is speaking to us. How many of you watch God TV? Most of us do, some of us do. Most of us do, we watch God TV. Now, the moment you switch on your television set, what do you do? You're flipping to the right channel until you get the right channel. And when you get the right channel, you get God TV on the channel. Now, in your mind, you want to watch God TV, you put on the right channel, you got God TV. But how does God TV come on your TV set? I'll tell you how it happens. It's simple, we all know. There is a, a transmitting station that is located in Israel called God TV. So they are transmitting from there. In fact, they have a dish that transmits from the dish and that transmission goes to a satellite. And from the satellite, it's being aired to your TV set. So you look at the process. From the transmitting station up to the satellite and then aired to your television. So let me just uh, give you uh, how, how it actually works. You know, I'm looking at God TV in Jerusalem, in Israel, the station being set over there, like the Holy Spirit. And I'm looking at the satellite like our spirit. And I'm looking at the TV set as my conscience. So from there to the satellite, from the satellite to, to the TV set. Now listen, my brother and sister, that's exactly how the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit will begin to transmit or begin to start communicating to my spirit and my spirit receives it and will transmit it through my conscience. Is it simple? Amen? So what happens is, supposing something is wrong with the satellite, it's not functioning. If it's not functioning, it cannot receive. If it cannot receive, it cannot transmit. And most often what happens is, our satellite is not working. It's not functioning. And because it's not functioning, our satellite is not able to receive from where the messages are being transmitted. And so therefore, I don't understand what the Lord is trying to tell me. Paul says in Romans chapter 9 and verse 1, he says, I, I tell you the truth, he says, my conscience bears witness with my spirit. Amen? So this is all. And therefore Daniel had his satellite well tuned. Daniel had a satellite in good condition. And so therefore, the scripture says, he had an excellent spirit. God wants us to have an excellent spirit. Sound is very important. Do you know that sound begins to move on sound waves? It does not go straight. It goes on waves. So which means, you are listening to me. Now, you are listening to me because you got your ears in tune to what I'm saying to you. Am I right? Now, supposing you are seated over here and you're thinking about your lunch. You close your ear to what I'm trying to say. Or you're sitting, you're, you're, you're thinking about an appointment that you made and you're looking at your watch and you're, and you're wondering, when is this pastor going to stop? You are shutting your ears from what I'm trying to say. Now listen, my brother and sister, what I'm trying to say this morning is not coming from here. It's coming from here. Amen? And what you are receiving does not come here. You are receiving it over here. Because your spirit is receiving from my spirit. And my spirit is receiving from the Holy Spirit. Amen? So it's important that we are in tune, and it's important, vitally important, that we don't miss out a Sunday morning 
you know, to come for a worship service because this is one time where we're giving to God our worship. There's a corporate worship and there's a corporate anointing that comes down. And when you leave this place, you never go back the same way you come in because you are nourished with the Word of God. You are being, uh, you know, totally anointed as a corporate anointing that begins to release upon this church and you go back differently. Amen? So sound, you know, goes on, sound wave, you're listening. My brother, my sister, if you don't listen, sound always reflects. It could hit this brick wall and come back and not get into our ears. Amen? John chapter 1 verse 4, uh, the life of God is in man. In you was life and the life was the light of man. That's what it says. Read it over there. In him was life and the life was the light of men. My brother, my sister, you have the life of God on the inside of you. You're a child of God. You received Jesus Christ once upon a time. Amen. And because you did what you did, you have the life of God on the inside of you. Now the life of God is not going to be latent on the inside. It has to begin to grow. It must grow, my brother, my sister. We must be able to see the life of God real in our lives. It builds us up. And we are built up on a, on a, on a continuous basis. Now, this is for the children. Those are going to college, those are going to school, university. This is for you. I want you to listen carefully. Go to Daniel chapter 1, verse 9. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the dean of the college. Yeah. It says, it says oh, the prince of the eunuchs, which means he was a dean of the college. They had a training institute over there. So the scripture says that Daniel found favor with the dean of the college. Amen. Now how do you find favor with your teacher or how do you find favor with your boss? The only way that I could find favor with the authorities over here is because I have found favor with God. If you find favor with God, God will make it a point for you to find favor with anyone else that you need to have favor with. Amen? Hallelujah. But I got two more wonderful verses. Let's go to verse 18. And this is for all the kids over here. It says, Now at the end of days, that the king had said that he should bring them, and the prince and the eunuchs brought them in unto Nebuchadnezzar, verse 19. And the king communed with them, and among them, all that was found, there was none like Daniel, none like Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that stood before the king. Look at verse 20. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them to be ten times more better than all the magicians, astrologers, and all the learned men around there. They were ten times more. Hallelujah. Church, please listen to me this morning. Compared to the people out in the world, we should excel ten times more than anyone else. Why? Because we are the head and not the tail. We are above and not beneath. Can you say amen, church? Am I preaching okay this morning? We must find favor. And when you find favor, not only do you find favor, but you'll begin to excel ten times more. Why? Because these children over here never define themselves. They refused to bow their knee before anything else. It was not their job that they bowed their knee to. It was not anything that they bowed their knee to. It was not anything else that they spent more time than what they spent with God. They spent, Daniel opened the window three times a day. He prayed and he always prayed the way he prayed even when he was threatened not to pray. Daniel was a man of prayer. The three Hebrew children refused to bow before anything else. They said our knees will bow only to one and to God and God alone. And my brother, my sister, when God seen that in them, he said, I'm going to make you ten times better 
than anyone else. Now, I want you to know the others were nourished. They had the best food that one could give. But these guys just had pulses in veggies. They were vegetarian, not even egatarian. And then the scripture says that their countenance was far better than anyone else. You see, your countenance is a reflection of your spirit. Hallelujah. They were under times sensitive in their spirit. We praise God for that. Coming to the main point, there are two experiences that every believer should have. What are the two experiences? Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 8 verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Verse 12 says, But when they believed, Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Go to verse 14. And when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria let me use a word over here, was having revival. You know, when Samaria was having revival, I'm reading, received the word of God, they were sent unto them, Peter and John, verse 15. And when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Now listen, church, this is not a contradiction. These guys over in the city of Samaria received the Lord. And then they were baptized. Peter was baptizing them. Why he was baptizing them? They were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And while this revival was taking place, and while this mass baptism was taking place, Peter and John in Jerusalem heard what was happening in Samaria, and they come to Samaria to help out. But when they came to Samaria, it says in verse 15, who, when they came down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Are you listening? Verse 16, for as yet he has not fallen upon any one of them. They were only baptized in the name of Jesus. Amen. The next verse says, and they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. So subsequent to receiving Jesus Christ and receiving the Holy Ghost, because you cannot get saved until and unless you receive the Holy Ghost. That's how salvation comes. Now, these people had salvation. They received the Holy Ghost. But Peter came and he said, no, 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 wait, Philip, we need to ask you a question. Who are these people? Oh, they all received Jesus Christ. They were all baptized. Did they receive the Holy Ghost? No, they never received. So then the scripture says, they laid hands on them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. There's another experience called the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Very important. Because you read in John chapter 4, let's read verse 10 and 11. It says in verse 10, Jesus answering and said unto her, If you know or if you knew the gift of God, and who is this that is talking to thee, asking you to give me drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given you living waters. Go to verse 11. And the woman said unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is so deep, from whence as thou have this living water. Verse 13. And he answered and said unto her, Whosoever shall drink from this water, which she was filling from, will thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water which I will give unto him shall never thirst, but waters that shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. This is receiving the Holy Ghost after salvation. Go to chapter 7 of the book of John, verse 37. And in the last day of the great feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any man thirsts, can I ask you a question this morning? Is there anyone that's thirsty this morning? Amen? So he says, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me. And let him drink. Come unto me and drink. And he that believeth on me, as the scripture said, out of his belly, belly, 
shall flow rivers of living water. Out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Tributaries shall begin to flow from the river. My brother, my sister, this is so very important which the church neglects. Amen? The Bible says that from your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And then it says, Jesus Christ speaking about the Holy Ghost that had not yet come, was not yet given, because Jesus Christ was not yet glorified, therefore he never yet fell. He has to come. He has to come upon us, not in us, but upon us. That same spirit that is in us is the very same spirit that will also fall upon us. Amen? And then when he falls upon us, from your belly shall flow rivers. It does not say river. It says rivers. What are these rivers I'm talking about? Rivers of salvation. You could be instrumental in getting people saved. Because from you will flow rivers of salvation. Rivers of joy. Rivers of deliverance. Rivers of healing shall begin to flow. A pastor called me up 400 miles away from Bangalore. He called me up and he spoke to me over the telephone. And he told me, he said, Pastor, in fact, I couldn't hear his voice. He was so feeble. And uh, another brother seated with him, he spoke to me. And he said, this pastor is almost dying. He's on his deathbed. I asked why, what happened? He's got malaria and a few other fevers, different kind of fevers he had. He was attacked with severe malaria. So he was about to die. I couldn't even hear his voice. And so I took the phone and I was trying to ask him, tell me exactly what happened. I couldn't understand. I couldn't hear what he was saying. But immediately the Lord showed me the spirit of Jezebel. Now, he's dying of malaria, but he showed me the spirit of Jezebel. So I said, okay. I started to bind that spirit. That spirit, I never prayed for his healing. I, I bound that spirit, Jezebel, that was trying to put him in that bed over there. And after I bound that spirit, disconnected the phone, ten minutes later the phone rang again. And when I picked up the phone, now the pastor is talking. And he's so excited. He says, Pastor, I want to tell you, I'm free. My malaria has left me. Now, who was seated with him was another doctor. He said, my malaria has left me. I don't have any fever. I am set free. What happened? Rivers of deliverance. Now, this, this happens in the church. But all said and done, when we come to a place where we need to understand something, more than you depending on a man of God, depend on the God of the man. He'll teach you all things in your spirit. Thank you.